The purpose of this video is to study the phenomenon of complex splitting and thereby to allow you to assign all of the protons in salicylamide as part of the bonus exercise for the NMR worksheet. In order for you to do that, we'll need to consider the spectrum of salicylic acid and methyl salicylate in addition to the spectrum that we've already talked about, which is aspirin. One thing that you notice if you look at all these structures is that you have a carboxylic acid residue or some type of it up here and you also have an oxygen at this position, be it an OH or with something attached. Because of that, B, C, D, and E all reside in very similar NMR environments in all of these structures and therefore they have very similar chemical shifts. In addition, because the arrangement of C relative to B and D stays constant and so on and so forth, then the J values and coupling patterns that they experience will likewise be similar. In other words, similar structures lead to similar NMR spectra, as you might expect. However, the structures above are relatively complex structures wherein the splitting patterns are quite difficult to discern. And in order to make things a bit more simple, we're first going to consider the spectrum of methyl acrylate. Whenever you're going to contemplate the NMR of a structure, it would be a good idea to go ahead and predict what you think the NMR peaks are going to be for each one of these protons. So if you look at A, C, and B, you see that they are all on a double bond, which means that the chemical shift for them should be roughly five to six. D, is a methyl group next to an oxygen, so it should be between three and four. There are three protons in the D environment, and there are one proton each in A, B, and C. The splitting and the J values, the multiplicity, that's going to be quite a bit more complicated. But it is easy to see that D has no neighbors. There are no protons anywhere near D, therefore it should be a singlet. If you look at A and C, you notice that they are on the same carbon. These protons are both on the same carbon, which means that they won't couple to each other very much in general. So you might consider that A is simply going to be a doublet based on B, C is simply going to be a doublet based on B, and that B is going to be a triplet because it is coupled to both A and C. So ahead of time, that might be what we would predict for this structure. So now if we comp contemplate the NMR spectrum, what you see is a tall singlet worth three, you see a doublet worth one, and you see a doublet worth one. Clearly this is D, this is A, this is C, and then here we have B. And lo and behold, it looks quite different. We should zoom in on the spectrum and see what it looks like up close. And what should we describe this as? Without getting too complicated, we can say that this is a doublet next to a doublet. So you might call that a doublet of doublets. So what's going on here? For the sake of the following discussion, we're just going to ignore D. It is off to the right on this spectrum, and we don't care about it. The interesting thing that we need to talk about are these three peaks, A, B, C, again, A, B, C. How do we decide that these are the way they should be aligned? Well, A is a doublet, C is also a doublet, and we can justify why those would be the case. They simply are coupled to B, and they don't couple very much to each other. Whereas B is a doublet of doublets. There's no way that you can justify B being a very simple proton. It can't be a simple doublet. It has to be coupled to both of these independently. So why is it showing up as a doublet of doublets rather than a triplet? Imagine for me, if you will, that B had no neighbors. What would it look like? It would be a singlet and it would show up at 6.15 give or take because that's where its chemical shift is. Now suppose that B has a single neighbor. Then what would it look like? Well, if it had a single neighbor, then this one peak would now be split into two peaks, in other words, a doublet, but the center of that doublet would still be at 6.15 parts per million because, of course, that's the chemical shift of B. 
it would just now have the appearance of a doublet. Suppose that we now split it again. It has two neighbors, one that splits it into a doublet. What happens to the next part of the splitting? Well, in that case, of course, each of the first lines that we had is now split itself in the same way, and so this becomes two lines, one here and one here. And this line on the right also becomes split in half, and it becomes two lines, one here and one here. Therefore, what you have in the middle is two lines, one coming from the left side and one coming from the right side, therefore worth twice as much as each individual line. And the pattern that you get overall is three lines, one, two, one, in terms of intensity, and we call that a standard triplet. How does this happen? Well, you must have J values involved here that are the same. That is to say, the red J value is exactly the same in terms of distance and energy as the blue J value. So your original peak, which is a singlet, becomes split into a doublet, which is itself split into further subdivisions that happen to add up just perfectly to give you a triplet pattern. So that's what happens when you have sort of simple splitting. If you have one neighbor, you have a doublet. If you have two neighbors and the J values are the same, then what you have is a triplet. If you have three neighbors and the J values are the same, you end up with a quartet where you have three similar J values that are red, blue, and purple, and the ultimate intensity pattern is 1, 3, 3, 1. And that comes because this single line is split twice, this doubly tall line in the middle is split twice, and then this single little line is split twice. And so when you add it all up, the intensity is 1, 3, 3, 1. So to recap, if you have no neighbors, you have a singlet. If you have one single neighbor, you end up with a doublet where those two lines are of identical height. If you happen to split it again with the same J value, you end up with a triplet. One, two, one. If you split it yet again with the same J value, you end up with a quartet. One, three, three, one. I'd like to point out that what we consider to be standard splitting is really a special case of splitting. If you have a quote-unquote simple quartet, what you really have going on is three different neighbors for a single proton that happen to have exactly the same J value. It's a special case. The first J value simply splits it into a doublet. The next J value, if it happens to be exactly the same, splits it into a triplet. And then the third J value, if it happens to be exactly the same, splits it into a quartet. Clearly this is a special case, and it doesn't need to be that way. Let's return to the thought where we have a symbol, simple singlet, one proton all by itself at 6.15, and now we introduce a single neighbor that has a J value, and we'll just describe it as this distance. What do we have? We have a doublet. This is always true. If you have one neighbor, you will always have a doublet. The distance described by that doublet, the J value associated with that doublet, changes depending on what is nearby. But one neighbor always means one doublet. But now let's suppose that it also has another nearby neighbor, but that neighbor splits it just a teeny tiny little bit relative to the original splitting. That is to say, there's less energy involved in this coupling than there was in the original coupling. What happens to this peak now is it's split in two, but a smaller distance than it was originally split, and therefore now you have this doublet becoming two doublets. In other words, a doublet of doublets. But the second J value doesn't have to be teeny tiny. It could also end up being a larger J value than the original J value. And what you'd end up with now is a different pattern altogether, one where you have a large doublet of doublets, which might end up looking somewhat different. It could end up looking something like this, where you have fairly significant gaps between the doublets, but it's still a doublet of doublets. And there's any number of different other possibilities you can end up with. Doublet of doublets can look quite complicated. The moral of the story is, what is a doublet of doublets? Well, it simply means that you have two neighbors nearby. You have one neighbor that gives rise to a doublet pattern, and you have another neighbor that gives rise to the doublet of doublet pattern.
Said another way, if you have one single neighbor, you will always end up with a doublet. But if you have two neighbors, then you will generally end up with a doublet of doublets. And in the specific case where those doublets just happen to be the right size, then what you end up with is a triplet. So a triplet is a special case. A doublet of doublets is the general case. So if we return now to the spectrum itself, what do you see? Well, you see a doublet here, which means that this proton has one neighbor. You see a doublet here, which means that this proton has one neighbor. And what you see here is a doublet of doublets, which means that this proton has two neighbors. Incidentally, that is how we decide that this proton must be A, it has a single neighbor, B. This proton must be C, it has a single neighbor, B. This proton here must be B because it has two neighbors, A and C. Now we should consider J values themselves. What we have here, if you look at the distance between these two peaks, is a J value that corresponds to 17.34 hertz. If you look at this peak here, what you have is a J value that corresponds to 10.8 hertz. If we return now to this spectrum, what you see is that A and B have a trans relationship across this double bond, which is to say they are on opposite sides of this double bond. And B and C have a cis relationship across this double bond, which is to say they are on the same side of this double bond. Traditionally, a trans relationship gives rise to larger J values, say 17 hertz, and a cis relationship gives rise to a smaller J value, like 11 hertz, or 10.8. So now we should simply write down what we know to be true. What is A? It is a simple doublet that has a coupling of 17.3 hertz. What is C? Well, it is a simple doublet that has a coupling of 10.8 hertz. And what is B? Well, we now know that it is not a simple doublet, but it is instead a doublet of doublets. Now, we also know that since A is coupled to B with a coupling value of 17.3 hertz, that means that B must be coupled to A with a coupling value of 17.3 hertz. By the same token, of course, B must be coupled to C with a coupling value of 10.8 hertz. It is not possible for A to have a coupling value with B and for it not to show up in B. Likewise, if C is coupled to B, then B must be coupled to C. So while we haven't examined this peak yet and found those coupling values, we must be able to do so. So if I measure from this initial peak to there, what do you see? A coupling value of 10.8 hertz. And if I measure from this peak here to this one, the larger coupling value, what you see is 17.3 hertz. This is as it should be. In order for B to have a coupling value of 17.3 hertz in it, it mu there must also exist a place in the spectrum, namely A, that has that same distance. This distance here is the same as this distance here. And by the same token, the smaller distance here in peak C also is showing up in peak B, there, and also there. And that's really complex splitting in a nutshell. Really what's going on is that we have differing sizes of J values, differing amounts of energy contained in the coupling. This could be a 7 hertz coupling and this could be a 2 hertz coupling, for example. Or, more like the system we're actually looking at, this could be a 10.8 hertz coupling and this could be a 17 hertz coupling and that gives rise to the pattern that you see here.